morning. Good morning. Welcome to Shepherd of the Hills. We begin our worship today with hymn 355. <laughs>
and for his sake forgive you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First lesson is taken from the Old Testament prophet Micah, chapter 5, starting with verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is taken from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 
chapter 10, starting with verse 5. When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these offerings, uh, <clears throat> these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is the word of the Lord.
please stand for the Alleluia and Gospel. St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in God, the Father, I'd like my confirmation students to come forward. I think there's only two of you, uh, but Owen and Lucas. Let's go over here in front of the Christmas tree. Have you guys sit down in those front rows. Everyone else may be seated. We're going to do a children's sermon, but a confirmation one. Go ahead and sit down here. No, you don't have to sit down there. You can sit in the chair. There you go. So I'm going to put you guys in the hot seat. So what have we been studying in confirmation? Forgiveness, that's good. As the Ten Commandments in particular is what we just finished up, right? So uh, how do you summarize the law? So the Ten Commandments are God's law, right? And how do you summarize the law in one word? Love, right? Love for God, love for neighbor, good. Um, so we get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, right? No. We don't get to heaven by keeping that. You're, you're right. How do we get to heaven? By believing in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and believing in his death on the cross. Good. So then why do we have the law? Why do we have the Ten Commandments? Why do we have these rules? If they're not the rule book to get into heaven, why do we have them? What's their job? Okay. Help us, help us believe, maybe. What's, what's the main job of those commandments or that law? What do they show you? Okay, follow the rules that the Lord has laid out. How about this? What's the difference between the law and the gospel? This was really recent putting you guys on the hot seat. The law shows us something and the gospel shows us something else. Good. The gospel shows us what God has done for us. The law shows us what we should do. 
and it also shows us our another S shows us our sin good why do we need to know our sin does God just want us to feel miserable no why do we need to see our sin so that, so that what with two answers so, you, so we could try to do what's right okay that's part of it and then what else learn from it okay try to do better even more important shows us our our need for faith right so we see the law and we think oh my goodness I have not kept this I, I am I have sinned I need my Savior right and I know you guys understand that because we talked it through in class you know I, one of you guys said I said what happens when we know we're sinful and we feel guilty and one of you it was one of you guys said run to the cross okay and that was really well said you know so the the, the law shows us our sin. It shows us how we haven't loved God perfectly, haven't loved our neighbor perfectly. Yes, it reminds us to try again and try harder, but even more importantly, it shows us a need for our Savior. Uh, what's the first commandment? No other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That one's a little bit different. It's a little bit shorter than the others. Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So the commandments show us our sin and our need for a Savior. The gospel, uh, which we hear from God's word. Uh, the gospel is the good news that Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. The gospel shows us our Savior. So, well done, guys. I put you on the hot seat today. I told you I'm not going to do quizzes, but we're going to do this occasionally. <laughs> this will be the quiz, so we're not going to do written quizzes. So you guys do well, and uh, you guys carry the rest of the class, even though they're not here. We'll just we'll say that they did well too. So all right, well thank you, gentlemen. Um, we continue with our sermon hymn, which is number 384. Um, I misprinted the hymn number in the bulletin, so follow the hymn board. 384 of the Father's Love Begotten.
king who has come, who continues to come, and who will come again on the last day. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. The presence of our Savior results in joy and praise. That's the big takeaway from this visitation between Mary and Elizabeth this morning. The presence of our Savior results in joy and in praise. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, into a town of Judah, and entered the house of Zechariah. In those days. Apparently, pretty quickly after Mary had received the good news from the angel Gabriel that she was going to be the mother of the Savior, she arose with haste, went to that house of Elizabeth. Now, Mary wasn't the only one who had a miracle baby. Both of these women had miracle children. Mary, of course, uh, con was con conceived before she and Joseph came together. She had a miraculous virgin birth. And Elizabeth was old and she was barren. Both parents had a visit from the angel Gabriel, but their responses were somewhat different. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was high priest. He was ministering in the temple. Maybe he wasn't high priest, but he was a priest. Um, he was ministering in the temple. And when he went in to offer the sacrifices, the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him that his wife, Elizabeth would conceive in her old age and bear a son. And Zechariah responded with a bit of doubt. How can that be? That's, you know, that's impossible. That's scientifically impossible. And Zechariah was punished with uh, having to be mute. He was unable to speak until his child, John, was born. He responded not with sincere faith, but he responded with a bit of unbelief, a bit of skepticism. Mary, on the other hand, responded with a question. We might wonder, well, if Zechariah asked why and Mary asked why, why was Zechariah punished with this muteness and Mary was not? Well, Mary was asking from a position of faith. She asked, how can this be? Because I am a virgin. But she did so not from a position of unbelief, but from a position of faith. Just, well, how, how can this happen? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and the power of the Most High will cause this to happen. And then when she got that response, Mary said, let it be done to me uh, according to God's will. I am the humble handmaiden of the Lord. So a couple of different reactions from those parents. That is the context leading up to uh, today's very brief gospel lesson, this visitation of Mary and Elizabeth. All week long, I've been telling my shut-ins that Mary probably went to visit Elizabeth, maybe to get away from the gossip around Mary's virgin birth. I don't know if that's true anymore, though. I think I was wrong about that. Um, I might have to correct, uh, correct myself next time I go. Mary is in the very early months of her pregnancy here, so it probably would not have been very evident that she was pregnant yet. So perhaps she has gone to um, help Elizabeth. Elizabeth is old, and now she's pregnant. She's old and pregnant. She's going to need a little bit of help. Um, Mary comes um, to, to the home of Elizabeth and Zechariah when Elizabeth is six months pregnant, and Mary stays for another three months. So I'm going to guess that that's probably one of the main reasons here. Mary is going to go to a company and help Elizabeth during this time. No doubt Elizabeth's going to need a little bit extra help because not only is she pregnant, but she is also advanced in age. But both of these two women, they're, they're relatives, and both of them share a very special and unique experience. Each of them has been uniquely blessed by the Lord with a miracle baby, who uh, is not just a gift to them, but really is a gift to God's people and indeed gifts to the whole world. For John's purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus. We've heard quite a bit about him throughout Advent. He was to call people to repentance and soften the hard hearts so that when Christ came, he would have a ready and prepared audience. And of course, Jesus came as the Savior, not just to the Jews, but to all who would believe. Not just to the physical sons of Abraham, but to all of those who had the faith of Abraham, believing in that promised seed of Abraham. Our God is a God of miracles. He is a God who often does things that are scientifically impossible. And he can do that. He's allowed to do that. He is God after all. He's the one who created 
the so-called laws of science. Our God has overcome many barren wombs throughout the Old Testament. Sarah and Rachel, the mother of Samson, uh, Hannah, who was Samuel's mother, and now uh, Mary, in her own way, has not necessarily a barren womb, but nonetheless, she's given a miraculous conception, a uh, miraculous birth, within a uh, conception within her womb and a miraculous birth. And here, Elizabeth, in her old age and her barrenness, likewise, the Lord has overcome that. The Lord can turn mountains upside down. He can turn the world upside down. And he has done that in order to bring his Savior, this promised seed, this promised son, promised to Eve, promised to Adam in the garden. The Lord is making that promise come to fruition, even in the face of things that are humanly impossible and scientifically impossible. Our Lord is capable of great and tremendous things. And so Mary and Elizabeth share this incredible and special joy. Not only do they have miracle babies, but they have babies who's uh, who have special roles in the coming of God's kingdom. Mary, that long-awaited and long-promised Savior, has finally come to her. We saw last week during the Christmas program that there were at least a couple of different women early on in the Old Testament who thought that they gave birth to the Messiah. Eve was one of them. You know, all right, here we go. The Lord promised a son who would save us. Here he is, Abel. No, it wasn't him. Uh, the time was not yet fulfilled. But here, now it has happened. Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, these are Old Testament saints longing for the coming of that promised one. The old covenant is wearing out. The old covenant is coming to an end. The old covenant was not able to change hard hearts by means of the law. The old covenant's job was to imprison the people under sin and make them hunger and thirst for a savior. The law shows us our sin, but the gospel shows us our Savior. And now that gospel Savior has finally come on the scene. Mary knows it. Elizabeth knows it. And they are incredibly joyful. Personally joyful because of these children, but perhaps an even special, an even greater and more special joy because of how special uh, the Savior Jesus is and uh, John and his role that he would play as well. Now Elizabeth exclaims with a loud voice and proclaims that Mary is blessed among women and blessed is the fruit of her womb. And those words might sound familiar to some of you, not just because they're here in the Bible, but because they are in the Roman Catholic rosary, a prayer to Mary. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your, uh, of your womb, Jesus. And then they go on to ask Mary to pray for us sinners. Um, now, you know, Mary being blessed. What do we make of that? Well, Mary is blessed in this sense. She is blessed with the Lord's favor, with the Lord's grace and the Lord's mercy. Again, back to the Annunciation when she received that good news. She said, let it be done for me according to God's will. She is blessed not because she is holy in and of herself and then bestows blessing on us. She is not somehow you know, some quasi-goddess up there in heaven who is able to answer our prayers and bestow grace on us. But Mary is full of the Lord's favor in the sense that the Lord has poured great favor into her. And now in her womb, this truth is shown. God is there upon his throne. Mary is blessed in that sense. She is blessed in the sense that she has received great blessing from the Lord. She has been especially favored with this privilege of bearing the Messiah. It's not that she has grace and blessing to bestow upon us, but rather she is the Lord's servant just as we are servants of the Lord. And Elizabeth responds with, with fear of God and humility. Uh, she marvels, what is this blessing that the, that the mother of my Lord should come to me and come to my house? She fears God. She is blown away by this privilege and by this majesty. She is humbled by this experience. The presence of our Savior results in worship. It results in that feeling of humility before God, reverence and awe and respect and fear of God. And the presence of our Savior results in joy and in our, uh, us opening our lips to praise Him. This short, short gospel reading is full of all sorts of takeaways, all sorts of applications. We see the uh, importance of 
uh, of the incarnation that our Lord Jesus took on human flesh and that he entered into this world with a body. He didn't save us from heaven. He didn't save us by snapping his fingers or pressing some magic button. He saved us by becoming one of us. He saved us by becoming like us. He saved real flesh and blood sinners from real flesh and blood sins by becoming a real flesh and blood Savior. And so the Lord wants to redeem our bodies. When we die, our body doesn't just go in the grave and and, and rot away, never to rise again. Quite to the contrary, the body is God's creation. He gave Adam and Eve a body. Sure, sin brought uh, shame and brokenness and sickness and pain into those bodies. But the Lord wants to redeem that. And the fact that he took a body, the body of his creatures, shows that the Lord has regard for our bodies. The Lord Jesus took a body so that he could die in a body. The Lord Jesus took on a body so that he could rise from the dead in a body. The Lord Jesus took on a body so that he could rise to heaven still with a body and reign for all eternity with that body. He is the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. Since he has defeated death in a body, the Bible tells us that all who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death and into his resurrection. So we too will rise in the body, not just as spirits. Eternal life isn't just as spirits, but eternal life is in renewed bodies and renewed souls. There is an importance to flesh and blood reality here. Our Lord does not despise the body, but quite to the contrary. The body is his creation and he redeems it even after sin has come into the world. We also see a good deal about the importance and even the sanctity of the family here. Uh, Within two uh, real families, the Lord has caused real babies to be born. Again, our God isn't just some God who saves us in some intellectual sense. He doesn't just save us in some spiritual sense, but body and soul, he wants to redeem us. And well, bodies come into this world in the context of the family. Mary and Elizabeth are extended family, but then we also have those two uh, you know, families uh, as well, mother and father and child, and we see the Lord working within those realities. He does here within these you know, extraordinary cases, but he does so as well within our family. The family has a special role in God's kingdom, populating the church on earth. The Lord wants children to be raised by mother and father uh, and to be brought up in the nurture and admonition of of the Lord. Uh, These are holy realities. These are realities that have been taken for granted in our day and age, and we would do well to maintain the sanctity of the family and the sanity of the normal uh, God-ordained biblical family as well, in spite of the world around us. Men ought to endeavor to be men, women ought to endeavor to be women, and we ought to take these realities of the family very seriously more important than our jobs, more important than other pursuits out there in the world. Because in the family, children chiefly learn about Jesus. In the family, children chiefly learn how to be uh, decent, God-fearing people. Uh, This this plays a big role in God's plan. Uh, We also see the sanctity of the unborn, the sanctity of life. John the Baptist is not just a fetus. He's not just a clump of cells. John the Baptist, in the womb of his mother, is a human, and he rejoices in the presence of his Savior. There is something holy. The Lord has fearfully and wonderfully made life within the womb. He has knitted together precious little children in their mother's wombs, and that ought never to be snuffed out by abortion. That is a a completely inverted and satanic sort of thing, that a child should be murdered within the womb, for the sake of the convenience of grown-ups. In the Christian scheme of things, it works the other way around. The weak sacrifice for the sake of the strong, not the weak, sorry, the strong sacrifice for the sake of the weak. The strong sacrifice and lay down their lives for the sake of the weak, not the weak and those who are easily brushed aside in the womb, snuffed out for the sake of the grown-ups. So we see the sanctity of life here in this, in this gospel reading. A related thought, too, we see the faith of the unborn. We see that even in the womb, children are precious to the Lord and can and often do indeed have 
faith. Psalm 22, verse 10, uh, the psalmist says, From my mother's womb, you have been my God. So even children who die before they are born uh, within Christian parents, we can, we can assume, we can, we can hope um, uh, you know, that, that they are saved and are with the Lord. Um, that they are, even though they, don't have, you know, they haven't been baptized or we haven't heard them express their faith with words, um, nonetheless, we see here in this text, we see from other places in Scripture that even within the womb, the Lord loves, uh, loves his children. Um, and, and, you know, John the Baptist jumping in the womb, he recognizes the, the presence of his Savior. So we can draw comfort from that as well, that the Lord uh, cares deeply for his, his children, even children who are in the womb. We see the importance, likewise, of face-to-face -face fellowship here. Mary wasn't just content to stay in her home and Elizabeth, you know, stay alone as well. But there was this incredible joy that the two of those women had with this face-to-face -face fellowship. No doubt uh, they were both brimming with, with joy, uh, with, with this unique opportunity that each of them had, this unique way that the Lord had favored them. And um, each of them uh, probably uh, was able to know a little bit better about what the other was feeling. Um, and, and they were able to rejoice and give glory to God and just delight in that presence with a face-to-face -face fellowship. Face-to-face -face Christian interaction is essential. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am gathered among them. Uh, the Lutheran confessions lay down two sacraments. They divine, d define two sacraments or two means of grace, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But there's a couple of other places, it's quite interesting, a couple of other places in the confessions where um, our Lutheran forefathers say, well, if you define a, a sacrament or the means of grace a little bit differently, there's a few other things that might count as a means of grace. And one of the things that they list, a very academic, important-sounding word, the mutual consolation of the brethren. It just means Christian fellowship, face-to-face -face Christian fellowship, where we encourage, where we uplift, maybe where we challenge or rebuke each other, but where we, where we remind each other of the Lord's gracious presence. They say if you, can, if you define things in a certain way, if you understand things in a certain way, you could also say that this face-to-face -face fellowship of Christians is a means of grace. At any rate, we see that this face-to-face, -face, in the flesh, Christian fellowship is essential. It is not something that we should take for granted, and it is not something that we should so easily let others tell us is unessential. Uh, we've had coronavirus lockdowns. We, maybe we're out of the woods with those, maybe we're not. Um, climate lockdowns may be around the corner. Um, we're, we're consuming too much uh, fossil fuels, you see, and uh, going to things that are unessential, like church, you see, is a, is a misuse of fossil fuels. And uh, you might not be allowed to do that. Who knows? Uh, but it, it, lockdowns, people trying to pre prevent God's people from gathering together, happens all around the world. China, North Korea, communist countries, um, Islamic countries. People try to prevent Christians from gathering together face to face. And those persecuted churches, they don't, often they don't say, well... Caesar told us we can't meet together, therefore we're not going to. Um, they, don't, they often don't think, well, it's dangerous to meet together, therefore we're not going to. But quite the contrary, the church meets in places, in secret, in the hills, in the woods, in the back alleys, and in basements. The church around the world meets face to face because that Christian fellowship is essential. And I think we need to keep that in mind going forward. There may come a day where we too have to meet in the hills, shepherd of the hills, meeting out in the hills, out in the woods, uh, in secrecy. And if that day ever comes, by the way, please don't bring your cell phone. It's a tracking device. Uh, come without your cell phone or without any eye device. But the day may come where we may have to seek out that face-to-face -face fellowship, even though it is being banned or discouraged, because it is essential. We need it. We need that face-to-face -face Christian fellowship. And so in conclusion, uh, we see from this brief text of the visitation that the presence of our Savior results in joy and praise. Let us also greet our coming Savior, who has come in the flesh on Christmas Day. Let us greet him in just about a week away with joy and with our praises and with our worship. For he entered this world and took our problems upon himself. He took responsibility for sins that were not his, and he obeyed God's law perfectly. 
He died on the cross to shed his blood. His body is the new temple. And we, by virtue of our baptism into his death and his resurrection, are part of his body, the church. We are members, number one, members with him who is our head, but we are also members one to another. Therefore, let us greet the newborn king with joy and with praise. Praise that he has died on the cross for our sins and risen again, and praise that he has gathered us together to be part of his body, the church. In the name of Jesus, amen. We continue our worship um, with the prayers. Please stand. Uh, we include in our prayers this morning Megan Johnson, who is a friend of R.J. Banks. Uh, Megan is a very young woman, but has come down with a heart condition. So we, um, we certainly remember her in our prayers. And we also give thanks that um, our, our brother Mike Williams is joining us, uh, recovering from COVID and apparently doing, uh, doing a lot better than he was. So we will offer a special prayer of thanks there as well. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, worthy to be held in reverence by all people everywhere. We give you humble and sincere thanks for the innumerable blessings that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially per, for preserving for us your saving word and the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and provide faithful pastors to preach your word with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. And we pray especially for persecuted Christians around the world, in China, North Korea, in Nigeria, where there was a recent attack, and for all Christians in the Islamic world. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth, O Lord. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our schools and our children so that they may grow in useful knowledge and in Christian virtue and thus bring forth wholesome fruits of faith. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, from tyranny and anarchy, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and the needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. We lift before you, O Lord, those who are in need of our prayers, including Vaughn and Jean, Megan, Amy, Terry, Mike, Dane, Dennis, Betty, Roger, Ed, Robin, Doug, Crystal, Lillian, Velma, Karis, and Cindy. We pray, O oh Lord, for all who mourn, especially the Karstensen family in light of the death of Larry, likewise the Slusher family, the Boyer family, and the Brown family. O oh Lord, we pray that you will behold all mothers expecting children, especially Paige. We pray that you will keep uh, mothers and children um, healthy and well and bless the time of labor and delivery. And O oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and glory for answering our prayers on behalf of your servant, Mike. Thank you for bringing him uh, to a restoration of health and back here to your house. Accept, we implore you, O Lord, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and our powers, together with the offerings we bring before you as your humble servants. These things and everything else that you know we need, O Lord, we pray that you would hear us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we present our offerings.
The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your boundless mercy, you sent your servant John the Baptist to proclaim that in Christ the kingdom of heaven draws near. With thankful hearts we pray, come, Lord Jesus, confident that in his body and blood, given us to eat and to drink, we receive the forgiveness of sins and so proclaim his death until he comes again in glory. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into the Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the peace of the Lord. Amen. Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We conclude our worship with hymn 346. You may be seated. Hello again and welcome. Uh, great to have you here with us on the Lord's Day. Um, just a reminder, our Christmas Eve service times are 4 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Christmas Eve, uh, nothing on Christmas Day. Uh, so hope to see you at one of those services. I'd also like to give a thank you to our snow removal crew. Uh, thank you guys for having things ready for us here today with this first big snow of the season. Um, any other announcements? No announcements, all right. Well, God's, God's richest blessings to everyone. Um, have a good week. <laughs>